So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New York Historical Society. I'm Louise Mirror, New York Historical's president and CEO, and I am really thrilled to see you here in our beautiful Robert H. Smith Auditorium. I uh, understand we have a very um, large virtual audience tonight, and I want to send a big welcome and a shout out and thank you to those of you who are accessing the program via live stream this evening. Tonight's program, First Grade Culture Wars, the Children of the Rainbow Curriculum Controversy of 1992, is a part of the Bernard and Irene Schwartz Distinguished Speakers Series, which is the heart of our public programs. As always, I'd like to thank Mr. Schwartz for his great support, which has enabled us to invite so many prominent authors and historians to New York Historical. Just before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to uh, extend a very warm welcome to Ben Garcia, the Executive Director of the American LGBTQ Plus Museum, and to thank him for his great partnership. Um, it's such a pleasure to have a new colleague who is really just so terrific and energized by the work that we are doing together to, uh, to build a new building that will be the first ever home for the American LGBTQ plus museum. So thank you, Ben. <laughs> Attending uh, via live stream tonight is one of our New York historical trustees, Brian Kane, and I would like to thank Brian and all the members of our chairman's council who are watching whether in the auditorium or via live stream this evening for their great encouragement and support. I'd also like to recognize and thank tonight's co-sponsors, which um, include LaGuardia and Wagner Archives at LaGuardia Community College, CUNY. Um, I'd like to thank as well the New York City Council, the, all of the board of the American LGBTQ Plus Museum and the Stonewall 50 Consortium. Tonight's program will last an hour, and it will include a question answer session. Those of you who are here with us in the auditorium should have received a note card and pencil as you entered the auditorium this evening. If not, my colleagues are going up and down the aisles with note card and pencil. Your questions on those note cards will be collected later on in the program. Now to our speakers. Tonight, we are very honored indeed to welcome a great friend over many years to this institution, Daniel Drum. Welcome, welcome, welcome back, Dandy. Um, Daniel Drum is an award-winning educator elected to the New York City Council in 2009, and um, he represented the Jackson Heights and Elmhurst neighborhoods through 2021. Prior to his election, he was a teacher at PS 199Q from 1984 to 2009, and he received the March Ramo Award from the United Federation of Teachers. He also, yay. <laughs> he also founded the Queen's Lesbian and Gay Pride Committee and organized the first Queen's Pride Parade, which celebrated its 30th anniversary on June 5th. Um, we are also thrilled to be welcoming Dr. Joyce Hunter to New York Historical. She's a founding member of the Hedrick Martin Institute for LGBTQ Youth and was director and clinical supervisor of social work services. She also founded the Women's Caucus of the International AIDS Society and co-founded the nation's first LGBTQ high school, the Harvey Milk High School in New York City's East Village. She served as Human Rights Commissioner of New York City and on the New York State Governor's Task Force on Lesbian and Gay Concerns. We are also delighted to welcome Andy Hum, a gay activist, educator, and journalist. He was Director of Education at the Hedrick Martin Institute for LGBTQ Youth during the Children of the Rainbow controversy. He helped lead the campaign to get explicit AIDS education in the schools in 1991. And he was a spokesperson for the Coalition for Lesbian and Gay Rights that got the city's gay, bill, gay rights bill passed in 1986. He's been co-host of the weekly National Gay USA News Program since 1985. I am also uh, very personally delighted, and on behalf of New York Historical, delighted to welcome Randy Weingarten to our stage this evening. 
She's She has been the president of the American Federation of Teachers since 2008 and previously represented approximately 200,000 educators in the New York City public school system for 11 years as president of the United Federation of Teachers. Between 1991 and 1997, she taught history at Clara Barton High School in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. <laughs> Great pedigree. <laughs> And we're glad, glad to see you back on our stage in New York. Our moderator this evening is Stephen Petras. He is Director of Public History Programs at the LaGuardia and Wagner Archives at LaGuardia Community College. Since 2017, he's co-curated four exhibitions at LaGuardia, including a seat at the table, an exhibit on LGBTQ elected officials in the New York City Council and the state legislature. Prior to his work at LaGuardia, he held Mellon Fellowships right here at New York Historical and also at the Museum of the City of New York. He's currently working on a digital exhibit on the Children of the Rainbow curriculum controversy. Uh, just before um, I yield the stage to our speakers tonight, I want to ask you to please make sure that anything that makes a noise like a cell phone is switched off. And now, please join me in welcoming tonight's guests. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis, for that introduction. And I want to get started right away, because I know our panelists have a lot to say. You should have heard us in the green room. <laughs> um, but to begin with, for those not familiar with the Children of the Rainbow curriculum controversy of 1992, I want to give a very brief overview. Uh, in 1989, following the racist murder of Yousef Hawkins in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, the New York City Board of Education began to prepare a multicultural curriculum for the city's public uh, elementary school teachers to teach tolerance and uh, understanding of the city's many racial and ethnic groups. And I specifically use the word tolerance because tolerance was a term that was used frequently at the time. And the, the curriculum ultimately was 443 pages and uh, it was released in 1992 uh, and it was suggested, it wasn't mandatory, but it was suggested at this point for first grade teachers in the city. And uh, it ignited a firestorm. There was a brief section in the curriculum on families. And in short, the section indicated, uh, again, this is for first grade teachers and their students, that there are diverse family structures. There could be uh, multi-generational families, a traditional nuclear family, foster parents, adoptive parents, dual career parents, uh, teenage parents. And at the time, it really reflected the, uh, the nature of the city, the reality in the city. And there was also a ref several references to same-sex headed households. And this is what really triggered controversy at the time. Several districts in the city, especially District 24 in Queens, uh, really expressed outrage uh, at, these, at these references and debates ensued and vitriolic homophobic slurs were used uh, to condemn the curriculum. And ultimately the city's Board of Education voted to reject the curriculum by a vote of four to three. And in 1993, February, uh, several months after this, the school's chancellor, Joseph Fernandez, a supporter of the curriculum, his contract was not renewed which is another way of saying he was ousted. So that's a little bit of the backdrop. We'll get much more into the details of this. Our distinguished panelists were involved intimately in this controversy. But I, I wanna begin the conversation with a question for, for each of you, um, just to let the audience know what were you doing at the time as a professional and uh, in 1992, and what was your immediate response to the curriculum? And I wanna begin with Joyce, and then go to Andy, because you two are connected at the Hetrick Martin Institute. And then I want to follow, uh, then Danny and Randy to follow because of your connection to the UFT. So Joyce? Uh, Andy was uh, more involved in that than I was, because I was involved with the Harvey Milk School at the time, which was a few years old by that time, because the school opened uh, April 15th, actually, uh, in 1985. So. 
I was more involved with that. Uh, I was more involved with external stuff right. for Hedrick Martin, and that and was going into the schools and talking about gay issues and AIDS issues and things like that. And I was appointed to the uh, Multicultural Advisory Committee mm -hmm. for the schools. That's right. They didn't show us this curriculum before it went out to the public <laughs> where we might have been able to help. They, they wrote it, they felt some pressure to put gay stuff in it, so they stuck something in there. And I don't think that they did, I mean, it was well-meaning, but I don't think they did a good job. So that's what I was doing. And then, of course, once it came out there and became a controversy, we felt we had to defend it. Yeah. Right. And uh, at first glance, the audience might hear rainbow and think it was a queer curriculum. But again, it out wasn't. of 443 pages, there might have only been a few pages references to same-sex uh, headed households. One. <laughs> just, just a couple, right? <laughs> Danny, you were at PS 199 in Sunnyside, Queens at the time, a fourth grade teacher. Could you talk about what you were doing and your response? Sure, I was a fourth grade teacher at PS 199, and I had heard about the controversy around the curriculum. I had always been out to my mother, my family, and my friends since 1973, but I had never been out as publicly as I would become when I decided I was going to support the Rainbow curriculum. And I kind of knew that I had a weapon in my hand against the school board, District 24, that I was a good teacher, and um, there was a student in my class who, when I went down to uh, the schoolyard after lunchtime to pick them up, uh, she was crying hysterically. And I said, what's the matter? And, oh, she couldn't tell me, you know. And um, I said, come on, upstairs. And I brought the kids up, put the other kids in the classroom, took her out, and she said, um, the other kids are teasing me because my mother's a lesbian. Now, I had not really been like out, out in school. I didn't hide it, but you know, I only held, told a select few. But here I had known about this controversy that was going on in the schools. And then I was, as a gay man, was presented with this situation of a student who was coming out to me about her own family. And I really didn't know what to do. So I kind of waited. That was in April. And then the controversy went on and on. And then in September, when we were starting to come back to school again, my school board president, Mary Cummins, decided to bus, like, 10,000 people down to the Department of Education to protest the curriculum. So it had continued on for months and months. It was on television almost nightly, as I recall. Um, and I went to a meeting in the um, Lesbian and Gay Community Services Center and uh, specifically to address the controversy, which we did not expect. I think when we put the controversy in, and when, when we put the curriculum in, we just didn't expect this type of a backlash, you know? And I raised my hand and I said, um, I'm a teacher in District 24, and I immediately became the, the attention of the media. And the very first question, Randy, as a matter of fact, that I was asked by folks, uh, other supporters of the curriculum, was, are you a tenured teacher? <laughs> because that oh. really made a difference. And that's, I always use that as the arguments for supporting tenure. We need to have that academic freedom. And look where we are today as well. But anyway, that was my coming out. That was my support of the Rainbow Curriculum. And that was the reason why I supported the curriculum, because I had that personal experience of a student in my class who could have benefited from this curriculum. Mm -hmm. And the UFT held a press conference right around this time. And Randy was involved in this, too, as counsel to UFT. May I just add, Stephen, though? Yeah. I, they, the news media was all over my school. <laughs> it was like hundreds of people. I said, what do I do? I called the UFT, and the UFT said, send the media down to the headquarters, UFT headquarters, and we'll work with you on it. Randy was the legal uh, person at the UFT at the time, the attorney for the UFT. Sandra Feldman was the uh, head of the union. And Sandy Feldman, when we walked into that press conference, kind of banged on the table, and she said, nothing. Nothing is going to happen to these teachers who support the Rainbow Curriculum. And I've always been very grateful to the UFT for that support. Yeah, really. Randy? I think Danny just said it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, it was... <sighs> the... I'm having deja vu because of what's going on around the rest of the country right now to what happened in New York in the late um, 1980s and the early 1990s. I was the, I was the counsel to the UFT at the time. I was also teaching at Clara Barton High School. I was teaching 11th and 12th graders. Like Danny, I was out to 
parts of my family, and I always denuded my, deluded myself to think, oh, you know, I don't have to say that I'm gay publicly because, you know, everybody in my life knew it. But I was not, um, I never actually said, you know, I never outed myself. The, um, the gay and lesbian teachers um, groups knew and generally people knew. But, you know, we, we actually, Sandy, so as the curriculum issues were going on, there was just like, this was also at the time when there was lots of, as I would call it, AIDS hysteria mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, and what we, what we tried to do in terms of the UFT, because the UFT at that time was also really reflective of what the city was. Um, and so you had people who were very open-minded and you had people who were not very open-minded. And you had both of those groups of people on the executive board and you know the UFT is governed in that kind of way. But I say that to say that's why Sandy was so extraordinary because when it came to a human rights issue individually or collectively, what Sandy did by, she didn't have the, um, you know, the lawyers have a press conference with Danny. She didn't have a group of other people do it. What she did was she was basically saying to the city of New York that every bit of any power that the, a that the UFT had was going to be on the side of Danny and any other teacher who was in this situation and any parent who was in this situation, meaning that those who are vulnerable, those who are being attacked, those who are being bullied because of who they are, what they believe, the, a the UFT was going to be there. And she was very um, intentional in both the words as well as what she did. She, Sandy was not a person who immediately would say, okay, we're gonna hold a press conference right now and do this. This was driven by her passion and her fidelity to human rights as a basic rights. And, and she wanted to do it in that kind of way. And what we had done in probably the few hours between it took from us to arrange all that is she basically said to me, you make sure <laughs> that we have, whether, whether we have the law on our side or not, you make sure we are ready that day that if Mary Cummings guns in and tries to file a 3020A or any of these other things or anything against Danny Drum or anyone who's in his situation, uh, who is you know, fighting for this curriculum and fighting for that lived experience that we're gonna be in court defending and then also taking a proactive case. Before you leave the politics of it, because you mentioned the board became conservative and rejected this. It, the same board, the year before, voted four to three for explicit AIDS education with yeah. condom availability. Right. That was a titanic victory that we won. Yeah. And that, that was, it was a huge, it, it was, was huge. the front pages of the papers. But one of the board members flipped, Ninfa Segarra. She was appointed by Freddie Ferrer, who was the borough president of the Bronx. He couldn't get rid of her. She went to the other side, became a Republican, basically, and with Giuliani, and uh, that's what happened. That was the politics there. Absolutely, and um, it's, it's a great point to mention that the broader context about the, the arguments about condom distribution in public high schools. Of course, the, the Catholic Church took a strong stance against it, arguing that it would lead to adolescent promiscuity, and instead advocated abstinence. And of course, the supporters, AIDS and healthcare activists said this would uh, help uh, prevent the, uh, the spread of HIV. So it really divided the city. But yeah, they, they came uh, in support of it four to three. Uh, so thank you for that, that broader point. And I think climate is really important here, too, um, in the city at the time during the Dinkins administration. And, Joyce, I want to go back to you about, as a founder of Harvey Milk High School, it was founded, as you said, in 1985, small two-room program, though not exclusively for LGBTQ students, no. right? Um, right. We had uh, young people come in whose parents were gay right. and had trouble okay. keeping it together in, in school. They got bullied a lot. 
Right. Your, you know, queer parents. And the school wouldn't be publicly accredited as a high school until 2002, so it's a rather right. small It's a regular school. high school now. Yeah, well, could you tell us a little bit about the climate at the high school, the, the students, well, the in teachers, the, early days, the curriculum? Well, it's a long story, but um, in those early days, it was these young people who came to those classes in those very early days got the best education, in my opinion. Not that I'm a teacher or anything, <laughs> but I felt that they did it because it was, you to, you, uh, when you spoke to me earlier, you were saying something about culture. These kids got AIDS education, they got uh, education around different cultures of the kids who were coming to the class. They are, they, most, for the most part, they were kids of color and different religions. And so we had to deal with all of that stuff too, about why did your parents throw you out and why this kid's parents didn't. So you had that, all that cultural stuff and religious stuff was discussed in the class. And I have to say something, because God bless him, he's not with us now, but Fred Goldhaber was one hell of a teacher. And you know he passed from AIDS, but, so he really wanted them to have a well-rounded education so they got all the people would call on the phone and say what are you teaching in that school <laughs> I said excuse me uh, well math you know <laughs> English <laughs> uh, etc right, right. <laughs> so it was craziness so we had to deal with those kind of things and Fred really dealt with it really well and sort of a model in some ways in and my opinion yes yeah and, and, but and we wanna... also had that same, remember when the high school, when, the, when we had a building, or when you had a building and the high school opened separately in 2002, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you had this, there was the same kind of political pushback. And again, the UFT supported the school and was out there saying, this is really important for kids. Mm -hmm. And you need, and you said this, oh yeah, I was, I walked uh, Sandy in. Sandy Feldman was on PBS. I know, but I was, the, I was the president of the, of the UFT at the time, and I supported 85? in 92. When I well, said, well, who did I debate? Yeah. I thought it was you, or, or was it Sandy? It may have been Sandy. But in 92, but when she was the school, on the other side of the issue yeah, but at in, that time. But when the school started in 90, when, they, when, when you had the building in 92, this is the evolution in terms of the UFT. With the building in 92, we were there. We made, we, again, it's a matter of the, and Steve, you said this earlier, the kind of bringing alliances together, bring community together, mm -hmm. starting to actually make sure that people understood and respected lived experience. And so, you know, we at the UFT had gone from being resistant to the school earlier on to being completely embracing yeah. the school uh -huh. later on in teaching people about lived experience and in opening people up to diversity being a strength, not a weakness, and how we have to really think about not only New York, but education in, in, in general, as how do you both do what the, the Tocqueville said about common identity and embrace diversity in all of its wonders. There's one for two, more than 200 students in Alabama right now, charter school, for gay kids, uh, LGBTQ kids, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Right. Um, I, I want to, you said something earlier, Andy, that struck me, and I, I want to return to it. Uh, um, the, the District 24 in particular focused its criticism on the references to same-sex headed households. And there was much, um, many slurs, vitriol, this is sodomy, um, sexual deviancy, these kinds of terms. But to what extent do you think uh, the, the, were the opponents opposed to not only this, but multicultural and bilingual education in general? Well, Because the curriculum was about multicultural education in the broad sense. I mean, you know, the whole right wing in this country is racist and, you know, and opposed to all these things. They want, you know, they want to go back to, you know, a white supremacist Christian society or something. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of resistance to mold. I mean, multicultural on Fox News is just a bad, you know, it's a slur just to say that. So, sure, yes, of course they were. I mean, Danny would know better. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say Mary Cummins in particular was on television often um, speaking out against um, bilingual education, speaking out against multicultural education. Uh, another school board member, Frank Borzellieri, was going around pulling books off the shelves uh, against English language learners, for example. We call them L's. And he said, you know, there was a book called I Hate English. Unfortunately, he didn't read the book till the end of the story because the book was a little girl who comes in and she says, I hate English, I hate English. But by the end of the year, she loved English, you know? And he was pulling those books off the shelves. He was pulling books of, of Martin, against Martin Luther King off the shelves, you know? So this was the stuff that was going on, believe it or not, in New York City in the 90s, you know? Um, and that's not too long ago. And now, unfortunately, we're beginning, we're beginning to see that happen again, not just in Florida and in Texas, but even here in New York City with a council member from Queens, Vicky Palladino, who has now come out against Drag Queen Story Hour and is using words like grooming and, and, and recruiting and, and things that we haven't heard for years. And so it's resurfacing all over again. In many ways, to me, it seems almost like it's history repeating itself. Because they hear sexual orientation and they think sex. And this came up in the gubernatorial debate the other night with uh, you know, Tom Swazi saying, no, we shouldn't teach about sexual orientation and gender identity in the fifth grade. Uh, that's, uh, that's sex and genitalia. Co totally confusing the issue. A top public official. And Governor Hochul didn't do that much better, saying, oh, we better run this by the parents and the local school boards. Instead of, <laughs> of course we're going to do it. You know, Let's just work on how. Let's, yeah. let's work on how to introduce this so that everybody can understand it. Look, we have in... Um, Florida right now um, and Danny this you're you know I started I thought about this I had um, a young uh, not he's probably not so young as a school teacher in one of the uh, non big cities in Florida when don't say gay was passed and signed by DeSantis um, he's a gay kindergarten teacher um, an exceptional teacher, as you were and are. And um, he has a picture of his boyfriend. Um, mm -hmm. And kids would ask, and parents in his classroom um, really rallied around him. But I remember being on the phone with him literally for an hour. He huh. has since done some huh. press conferences with HRC. He did a great um, blog post for us. Um, but I thought about you, and as I was thinking about, and as I was talking to Corey, about how we support in situations like this, uh -huh. and how we make sure that people don't feel alone and bullied. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what Hedrick Martin was about, and that's what Harvey Milk is about. And so there's a collective fight we have to have, but there's also an individual support that the collective has to be around the individual who are the ones who are out there fighting these kinds of things. And, and watching how you became then city council, you know, and then city, the, the chair of the finance committee, it's really important to be able in these moments of time um, to actually support people who are taking these issues on in a real way. I think. Thank you. I think that's the point about coalition building that we were talking about before, Randy. And I mentioned, I was, I was re researching this and reading a poll by the conservative polling group, Frank Lutz and Associates. Andy and I were talking about this. That according to this poll in 1993, about 52% of New Yorkers disapproved of the Children of the Rainbow curriculum. And they broke it, broke it down into categories, race, ethnicity, religion blacks, whites, Latinos, about 54% of whites opposed it, according to this poll, 51% blacks, 36% Latinos. And what does this tell us about the nature of the city at this time in the fractured liberal coalition mm. and the importance of coalition building? Because it wasn't just the Archie Bunker types in Queens, but um, you had liberals like columnist Bob Herbert, Michael Tomaski, uh, historian Arthur Schlesinger wrote a book against multiculturalism, not about this particular debate, but a multiculturalism more broadly speaking. So I think it's very revealing about the, the liberal coalition in the city at the time. And you were part of that in the Dinkins administration. I, I was. I was one of his human rights commissioners. Uh, but, you know, what was a poll about? A poll was about what they were hearing in the press about it. 
which was not an accurate representation of what, what it was. Right. They, they were hearing sex, gay, ch little children. That's all people needed to hear, and I'm against it. I don't, I don't think I want that. Tom, as Tom Swazi saying that on the stage in 2022, you know, the same thing. So, so if, if you know, you, it's very, these are hard issues, but we need to explain. They need to be explained better, a platform better, et cetera. I acknowledge that they're sensitive. Look, it took until 1986 to pass a simple gay rights bill in New York, 15 years. We had the first bill in the country, and we were one of the last big cities to pass it. Right. It took, it was a struggle, you know? Well, if you don't build the alliances, um, I mean, we, we're, we're seeing this now in a very different political um, uh, chasm, I would say, in America. But if you don't build the alliances, what you, you, we will lose these issues. Because if you're not, if, if, if people are not standing by those of us who are you know, LGBTQ, we're gonna lose. And so it is really important to build a family-friendly alliance. And I think what happened, and Joyce did it, and Andy did it, and Danny did it, and we tried to do it in terms of the unions and others, you know, we started building alliances. And I watched PTAs, you know, of where um, same-sex couples started being welcomed. I watched, you know, the synagogue that my wife runs starting to have <clears throat> programs for children. One of the most meaningful, um, one of the most meaningful times in that synagogue is during Rosh Hashanah when there is a prayer for children, and you see, you know, literally scores and scores of kids under taluses being prayed for by the community and by families, and so you, you, you we part of us as advocates is how do we convince people. And how do we meet people where they are? This is something that Danny and I would tell you as teachers. Mm -hmm. Stephen, you would say the same thing. There's two, there's two rules that I learned as a teacher. One is, it's not what's said, it's what's heard. And the second is, you meet people where they are mm -hmm. to move them to another place. And, right. and that's mm -hmm. what we've all learned in these, in these fights. Just to Dan, address the issue of um, the uh, political climate at that time, yeah. in Queens we also had the murder of Julio Rivera, a young Latino man who was killed by three white supremacist skinheads, self-described, who were out hunting, and that was the word that they used for a homo to kill. They came upon Julio, they beat him over the head with a 40-ounce bottle of beer, and um, stabbed him in the back and left him to die on the street in Jackson Heights. We took that opportunity to work in coalition with Latino leaders to say that Julio was killed because he was gay, but he could have also have been killed because he was Latino or because he was different or for whatever reason it was. And those are the founding roots of the Queen's Pride Parade, the organization that I started, and to try to work with communities that are affected by discrimination. It's all the same root. It's ignorance and fear. Right. But how do we work with each other to overcome those issues? Yeah, and you, were, you showed great expertise at the time as a teacher founding the Queen's Pride Parade, and it really expanded the geography of the LGBTQ community uh, at the time in New York City. And there were some representatives, Tom Duane and City Council, Deborah Glick, the State Assembly, but they both represented Lower Manhattan. But here you are shifting it geographically at this time and holding a parade. And that, I think one of the consequences of the parade was the fact that groups were forming. Different Asian and Latino groups were coming together, marching under their banner. So that, that is a real pivotal moment. Well, what we wanted to do with Queen's Pride was to put a face on the tens of thousands of LGBT people who live outside of the borough of Manhattan. Because what Mary Cummins was trying to do was to say, those people in Greenwich Village, and she would use words like this, are trying to shove that stuff down our throats, you know, and no, Mary, we are your family, your friends, and your neighbors. We are your teachers, you know, and that was the power of coming out to say, we're right here in your district. We're everywhere, and, and, and that movement has grown, and, and, and Queen's Pride is actually in many ways very different than Manhattan Pride. It's a very community-based. People come out with their kids. They cheer on the different ethnic groups that march in the parade. 
Uh, and so I think we've been successful in that sense. But yeah, I mean, that is vital. And even in the battles that we have today, if you're talking about um, culture response of sustaining education, you know, um, if you're talking about critical race theory, teaching about African American history in our public school system, Asian history, whatever, we are all in this boat together. And we have to make sure that all of us work together on that same issue of teaching, and I hate the word tolerance, but I would say teaching acceptance of all the different groups of people. And we could not have passed the Gay Rights Bill in 86. With, I mean, we could have passed it in Manhattan in 1972, one, yeah. two, yeah. right? But right. the emergence of a, of a Queens club before, you know, even before the parade, uh, Lambda Democrats in Brooklyn, a Staten Island group, a Bronx group, yep. that started to make an impression, and that got us the votes that we needed. Absolutely. So absolutely. We had to take it out of, out of Manhattan, you know, and, and, it, and I see all these pride things happening. I have a house upstate now, and there's a, there's a Delaware pride, Delaware County, Republican County, Delaware pride happened this for the first time. An Ulster know? County. An Ulster. <laughs> you know, you're talking about the opposition of school board 24, and I think we forget today in 2022 just how much influence these school boards had at this period. It was a period of decentralization, right, which started in 1969 during the mayoralty of John Lindsay would end in 2002 under Mike Bloomberg. Um, Randy, would you just put some, <laughs> give us some context here, exactly what decentralization meant? I just, just want to ask meant. Andy, Randy a question. My thing back in the day was one of the things that the movement failed to do was to join these boards, yep. school boards. Yep. I, Critical. A few did. Some did, some didn't. Some did, but, but not enough especially not out in Queens. I ran, I lost. I'm sorry. <laughs> but so And nationwide, the Christian coalition was paying yes. special attention. Yeah. Ralph Reed was saying, we need to get our people on local on school, school boards. boards. That's why I was asking Randy about it's the, the context, the so decentralization period. So look, I, um, I have had very, um, I would say, very layered views about school boards in America, uh. as well as school boards in New York City. Uh. Um, New York City is a dependent school district, Say meaning a dependent school district, meaning that everything comes from the city of New York, meaning that the, you know, unlike a school board like in Ulster County or Delaware County or Rockland County where I grew up, where you would get, uh, your budget would be the property taxes and the state budget and then some dribblings from the federal government. In New York City, everything comes from the city of New York or the state of New York. So what ended up happening with these community school boards was unlike what happens in Delaware or Ulster or Rockland, there would be a complete disalignment between what they said was policy and what they said was financial. And, and everyone knows that budget is policy. Yes, there are some things that are not. So the school boards, so in general, school boards around the country have a lot of authority over the day-to-day -day things that happen in schools. And frankly, it makes sense that people in a community vote for a school board that, that is basically you know, having control over what happens in schools. That is basically a good governance approach. The reason I started with the dependent school district is because there's a complete dis misalignment. So what would happen in whether it was the community school boards or whether it was the seven member board of education, they would say, well, we have control over this, but we don't have control over this. And, you know, and so how do you not have control over lowering class size or getting more social workers, like uh, psychologists or nurses into a school or the implementation, the budgetary implementation of any curricular work that you have. And so what, what started happening was that the school boards all throughout New York City would just squabble over squabbling. 
And there was not a whole lot of people who ran for these things. And there was a bunch of corruption in different places. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why they were then, mm -hmm. not, not in Bloomberg's era, but actually a few years beforehand in, in um, Rudy Cruz's era, there was another huge reform that actually took out the school boards and had um, and and had a bigger, um, you know, and and had much more um, regional. Yeah, they had the regional boards. They had all these other things, but it was essentially the school boards became a place for bickering, as opposed to a place for real governance decisions uh. on on how to govern, you know, the education. But education really needs to have a, a place where a parent can say, I need X, Y, or Z. What Mary Cummings did was she wasn't representing parents. She was representing a power interest that thought that she was going to shift what was happening in New York City. It wasn't a parent in, in Danny's school, like the parent of that child, who should have been able to come in and say, don't bully my child. Really? And, wow. and so that, that's what a school board is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be the alignment of the, you know, of parents and community and others so that the schools are aligned with, 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 with people in community. Um, and so the decentralization idea, which was a good idea in concept, didn't actually work in reality. The union, we got blamed a lot for, because we were engaged in school board elections, but because very few other people were, then we got blamed a lot for controlling school boards. I wish we had one one thousandths of the control that anybody ever said we had. I would hope that I would do a better job than what was done. But that's, I think, decentralization, because the money was untethered from the school boards that never really worked the way it was supposed to. Mm -hmm. And look at District 24 in 1992, and a district that was becoming increasingly diverse, increasing number of Asians and Latinos, but there were nine white members of District 24. Yeah. I think eight of them were Catholic, one Jewish. And there was a Catholic priest on a public school board, um, which is not illegal, right? He has the right to run and win election, but well, you it, have was that not, in it was not Ramapo reflected. And in Lawrence right now. Hmm? Yeah, really? also have that in East Ramapo and Lawrence right now. Mm -hmm. You have a tremendous amount of, um, you know, people that are not reflective of the community that are on the and, school. And many of their children did not go to public schools. They sent them to private schools or parochial schools, and yet they're on the public on the school board. Mm -hmm. So there's oh, a real disparity yeah. there. Well, Father John Garkowski, who was the member of Queens uh, School Board 24 accused me of recruiting, you know, that old argument. And uh, mm -hmm. imagine now, here's somebody who's running Catholic schools, not public schools, you know, and he's sitting on the school board. But that tactic is being used today in places like Florida and other places around the country where we see these right people, the people on the right, coming into school boards because of what Randy was talking about. If you build a coalition, many of these people in, in Community Board uh, 24 back in the day in, in, in the 90s, they won with 600 votes, 500 votes, 400 votes, you know, out of a district of 44,000, 50,000 uh, families, you know. And that's how they're able to get in, and they're targeting school boards again. Steve Bannon and Chris Rufo, Steve Bannon in particular, has said that targeting school boards right now is the most important thing that they can do. And they're using that. I mean, it, it feels like history repeating itself. But Moms for Liberty, which is not, which is basically a group, a national group funded hugely by um, the right wing, they're using it to, for two reasons. They're using it to actually try to end public education as we know it and to try mm -hmm. to create great distrust because fear and anger is. Uh, frankly, what extremists are now doing mm -hmm. to try to undermine the democracy. So, yes. so this is a very intentional strategy yes. today, as it was for Mary Cummings back in your era, Danny. And the Supreme Court's decision, was it today or yesterday? Today. Right, today, right? And, um, you know, in terms of supporting um, parochial and uh, non-public schools with taxpayer dollars. Well, it's essentially you know. vitiated. The Supreme Court decision today essentially vitiated what was left of the Establishment Clause. They're saying, the Supreme Court says, if you don't give money to religious schools, you're discriminated against religion. The religious schools they're giving money to all discriminate against gays and lesbians, Muslims, etc. Yeah. The decision was, in a main case, 
where um, there are regional high schools. So someone, because they don't have enough kids in every county or in every town, so the districts would give money for like Andy to be able to go to a school in Randy's district because Andy's district didn't have a regional high school. And the case basically said, if you do that, if you give Andy money to go to the school in Randy's district, then you have to give that money, that same money, to every religious school that seeks it. Fascinating. Folks, yeah. it's time for audience Q&A, and I have some excellent questions, so thank you to the audience. I'll just, I'll read them and, and you can jump in as you'd like. How was it determined to implement this curriculum at grade one? Do you think the curriculum would have faced less resistance if it was taught to an older age group? Andy? Well, I'll just say all the curricula needed to be integrated in an age-appropriate way. I mean, again, I don't have anything to do with the writing of it, but I mean, that was, should be the job of everybody writing curricula. You do, that goes for sex, sex education, AIDS education, or any kind of education. You need it for every level. And, you know, and a lot of it is because there are gay parents sending their kids to school, and they deserve to be reflected in the curricula at every level. If I may, I have a three-year-old in daycare, Ramona, and one of her, her classmates, Rivers, has two moms. And they were talking about their parents the other day, and Ramona told me, Rivers has two mamas, and she just said it so nonchalantly and beautifully, and I was said, yes, and that's a beautiful thing. So this debate about when you introduce it, I think is, a, you know, was it fourth grade, sixth grade, first grade, third, you know, Danny, you have insight on Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we wanted to do demographic data collection with the Department of Education and other agencies that provide social services. So I wrote legislation, and the Department of Education uh, was saying, oh, we can't uh, do that until they're 14 because they don't really identify. And I said, no, I'm not trying to get anybody to be forced to identify. It'd be voluntary, you know? But then I brought up the point, there are transgender students who identify as transgender at the age of three and four. And so let's even put the parents aside and just say, what are we doing for those children in our school system if we don't have books that are appropriate to what their lived experiences are? Okay. So I say it's appropriate to start it from birth. You know, we need people to see LGBTQ families as normal, as thriving, as wonderful, as loving, and, and just accept it for what it is. We are a part of society, and kids need to know the truth and the reality of our lives. Yeah. I Joyce? think the issue, the issue at that time, and, 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 and Andy said this already, is it kind of just got dropped in, as opposed to there being a whole runway of what are we doing and why and why is it important and how do we make sure that people see lived experience and things like that. And I think it's, I think what, what I mean, look at the difference. Um, I mean, think about, for example, just what has happened, even in this horrible political climate that we have right now, what we have done as a nation about Juneteenth explaining what it is and why it's important yeah. and why it is an important way that to see uh -huh. lived experience and how could we have a situation where people were free from slavery from the emancipation proclamation but didn't know it until two and a uh -huh. half years later um, in terms of what happened and I think part of um, in retrospect what happened is that there wasn't that kind of work done in advance to make sure that people understood the reasons why this was important. So who was the first person on TV to say it was bad? Were the people who were the fear mongers. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was part, I think that, 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 that I would say for the person who asked the question, what Andy and, Dave and, and Danny just said, if we have to make sure that people feel comfortable in their skins and that people feel comfortable in their lived experience. And as teachers, we have to make sure our students feel comfortable. And, and, and so if they have two people of the same sex who are moms or dads, that's their family. That's our obligation to make our kids feel comfortable in their classrooms. But even if you do it perfectly, the right wing will find something to exactly. pick at and distort. And that's the problem. I mean, on our television show, 
you know, we, we're reporting every week on all the censorship and the banning of the books and the banning of Don't Say Gay. So I lean into the screen and I say, kids, if you're watching, you can get all this information on the internet. <laughs> and what we're doing is we are actually, as a union, we are distributing a million books this year called Reading Opens the World. World. So as they are banning books, we are giving kids books and parents books of diverse titles in all sorts of places in America. And in fact, Good we were just you. in Queens last week and there was a line three blocks long mm. in terms of that book distribution. It's uh -huh. about reading, it's about literacy, but it's exactly what you're saying. We're not going to let them stop our kids from becoming critical thinkers and understanders and embracers of the world and of people around them. Here, here. And just to follow up on that, you know, um, when I was teaching, I used to, do, used to do newspaper education in the classroom. And around 94, I think it was, Karen Burstein ran for New York State Attorney General. And Guy Molinari, the borough president at the time, put it on the, you know, came out and said that she was unqualified to become Attorney Unfit, General. Unfit said. to be a, Attorney General because she was lesbian, right? So that day it was on the front cover of Newsday. My papers came in. I said, you know what? I'm not going to say anything, you know, or do anything because here I am, the gay activist now, the teacher out. I put the newspapers down. And the way I operate my classroom was we had centers, kids work here, kids work there. And then one of their things was to come over and read the newspaper. So I didn't say anything. They started to, you know, open the newspaper and read the story about Karen Burstein. And make a long story short, I brought the class together at the end and the discussion started and they knew everything. And I said, well, how do you know so much about LGBT people? They were so positive, they spoke about it. And this was fourth grade, by the way, okay? A regular classroom. And they said, Mr. Drum, we watch Oprah Winfrey. You know? <laughs> of course they do, you know? They know what's going on in the world. And why do we think that they don't know what's going on in the world? Second audience question. Can you articulate the most compelling and charitable argument made at the time against the rainbow curriculum? Tough question. <laughs> the most compelling argument is against. against. Most compelling and charitable argument against. Because I think, just to, I'll say a word here, is that someone like Matt Foreman from the Anti-Violence Project said, we can debate this. We can debate gays in the military, but we won't allow lies, myths, and distortions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what happened, ultimately. There was a March for Truth in Ridgewood, Queens in April 19... 93 to counter that, but were there compelling arguments that... The arguments they all made were what you said. It's sodomy. It's, you know, you're teaching kids how to have anal sex in the first grade. That's what they would say. So how, you know, how do, we, how do you be charitable about that? Uh, you know, it, we could have, certainly have discussions with people, and we would try to explain what it really is, and then see if they still oppose it, and some would still oppose it. I know whenever I went to speak about these issues, no matter where I was in any borough, this, I would call them stupid questions. And I used to always say to myself, there's never a stupid question, but a question that needs an answer. But how do you answer that? I mean, I was like, my jaw would drop when they asked a question like that. What are you teaching? Not only by the phone, but they would, in a, when I did the, what was his name? Phil Donahue show, I would get questions like that. And what are you guys are doing in bed and what are you teaching these kids? I, I couldn't believe it. I said, excuse me, where is your, I asked them, where is your head? It, it's gotta be in the gutter. <laughs> Because this is not what we're teaching but our the, kids. But the right I was so much better at messaging, I mean, in an effective way, than the left. Oh, if you distort it, if you lie about it, I that, that's the, messaging? Look, I mean, fear, fear is right. always a much more um, intense um, motivator than acceptance and tolerance and understanding. Okay. And I think what, um, you know, I th Andy said this earlier. I think, uh, I think we didn't do, and you know, I was, at the, I was at the UFT at the time as a staffer. No one did a good job in either, in talking about the whys. Like why was this important and why were we doing it? And I think because no one did, in some ways, just like when the craziness about CRT started last year, 
you know, in the aftermath of um, the 1619 project, you know, many of us as educators just thought this was so far-fetched. Why would we even talk about this? We don't teach critical race theory in K-12. And so no one actually answered the question about the why and families and being more embracive and the reasons for the multicultural curriculum. That New York City had a very long history of being terrible at implementation at, at, of anything. <laughs> and I think that that, and, and so as a result, it was easy to distort it and there was no one talking about why we needed it. There was a lack of commitment at the Board of Education, I'm talking about the staff who were doing it, to doing it right yeah. and working with, with, they could have worked with us more closely and we know how to talk about these issues yeah. like mm -hmm. Joyce is talking about. Well, but they, or the but they were so afraid of it, they exactly. were so afraid of it, well, let's just put something in. Uh, and they didn't, they didn't. And we need the... to answer them honestly, the best answer and not try to be nice about it. I'm sick of being nice. I mean, the thing that ultimately killed Rainbow was when Joe Fernandez, and I like Joe Fernandez, was when he admitted that he had not read the curriculum before putting oh, it out. Right. Oh, right. Jesus. But of course that was the run, end. But, but of course they didn't run it by him. And I, you'll see in the stories, he said, I would have phrased something, for, but he stood by us. He was going to leave anyway, by the way. I mean, you can say he got forced out, but he was ready to go because they were giving him such a hard time on everything. Yeah. And but, look, by the end of that year, I mean, if you remember, we did get domestic partner benefits mm -hmm. as one of the last things that um, Mayor Dinkins did. And so it's not as if every, what, what, what continued to happen was that there was still a march towards equality in mm -hmm. lots of different ways. Um, but, you know, we tried different things and did different things. Okay, final question. It's approaching 7.30. Just in short, would you say, what, what was the major, what your major takeaway from this episode, the lesson learned as we move forward to today? Because, of course, <laughs> I know it's a big question, but the, the lessons learned from this episode. I think the ones involved should answer that. <laughs> I think we have to remain vigilant. You know, I think look what's happening all across the country and uh, the lessons from Rainbow, while some of us have learned them, I think that because we don't have LGBT history taught <laughs> to folks, you know, which is so vitally important, they don't know it. And I think that uh, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And that worries me, having even been chair of the Finance Committee and have put in programs in the Department of Education that are still there. And fortunately, even this mayor has stood up for Drag Queen Story Hour. But we must remain vigilant, or we will see those gains wiped out. We have to be very strong about this. I mean, also, we can't be defensive all the time. That's I mean, we, yeah, we had a setback with this thing. And it set us back, for, you could say, for years. Uh, and because every chancellor who came in said, oh, I'm not going, I'm not going to touch that issue because it got Joe Fernandez fired, which was a canard, but that's what they believed. I think we have to be aggressive. Look, their line now is gays are grooming, grooming our children to be homosexuals. That's oh, their line please. now. No, all teachers. Huh? Not just gays. All right. All teachers. And, and uh, <laughs> I would say... Get your canard right. I would say <laughs> they're grooming, folks, they're grooming you for fascism in this country. And I oh, say that please. without reservation. That is what is going on. Yeah, I, I, think, I hear you. I think we, I, as you asked that question, Stephen, I thought back to something, a panel I was on earlier today with a labor leader from the Philippines. And we were talking about uh, Marcos's son being elected and Duarte's mm -hmm. daughter being elected and how that young people in Philippines have bought into this, we're in a post-truth society right now, mm -hmm. and they don't know the history, the real history of Marcos's regime and the, and, and the repression that happened. We have to be storytellers. Mm -hmm. We have to be able, we can't just pretend that history or that as, as much as I love King, that the arc of justice will continue to bend. We are the ones who bend it. And part of bending it is to tell these stories. 
and to talk about what happened when and to talk about that evolution and to talk about basic humanity and basic human rights and people as people. Um, because we're in this race, as Andy just said, between fear and hope. And if we don't find ways of making sure that common humanity, basic dignity, and this is what the children of the rainbow, that's what it represents. Heather has two mommies. It's basic dignity of children in terms of how they live and how they feel. Thank you, Randy. That's a perfect place to beautifully said. And before I, I ask for a round of applause, I do want to let the audience members know that uh, we have a card. We at LaGuardia and Wagner Archives talk about telling stories and sharing them. It's fundamental to what we do. And we just launched this month two exhibits, one on LGBTQ elected officials in New York City Council and the state legislature, Danny included. <laughs> and um, it, the New York Historical Society launched it. It's online on their uh, website and there's a there's a card you can find the uh, QR code and the tiny URL also today we just launched children of the rainbow curriculum exhibit as well Danny included <laughs> and you too Andy so you can see oral history excerpts great photographs done by our students at LaGuardia Community College so please check that out it's really I think a tremendous resource will enrich this conversation round of applause for our panelists